Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Happily Spring Festival 2023. Today is day four. I can see a lot of teachers have been following us uh, from day one till now. Today is day four, and tomorrow is day five, the last day. We are going to have closing plenary by Barbara today. It's a very special day because today is about motivation. Um, in the recent our uh, events, we have a chance in Bibelt in during February. Uh, we have posed a very big question during our in our booth. We asked all the teachers in the event, what topic would you like to listen to, and what topic would you like to learn? What topic are you interested? Very surprising. Seventy percent of teacher all mention about motivation so we are going to have about motivation today and for teachers if you are new today i think uh, i'm not going to introduce us in in great detail it's because i think some teachers know us for the last four days already three days and if you don't know here we are i'm catherine she i'm the academic director for happening mexico and central america and on the screen, you will see our happening academic consultant team, and Daniela and Luis. Okay, you have seen them, uh, you've been chatting with them on the chat room already. They will be looking after our chat room today. So if you have any questions, please just write on the chat room and please make sure you tick everyone. So we can see and then we'll be able to answer you. Before I move on, I want to do some housekeeping. All the teacher will be asking, will you get a recording of the uh, webinars for the one you didn't attend or you attend? Yes, you will get all the recording of our five webinars after the event. So we get some time, we can tidy up the recording. Okay, you will get all your certificate after, if you attend our live session after the event, you will get the digital certificate. But if you are watching the recording after the event, I'm sorry, there is no certificate because they also only give the digital certificate to people who attend the live webinar. All right. The next thing is, uh, I think I pretty much explained the webinar, the, uh, the recording and the certificate. And one more thing, I know some teachers, you may write your name wrongly, on the Zoom because the certificate is sent automatically. So if you have your name written wrongly, don't worry, please uh, send an email to our academy team or we'll write on the chat room. They will help you to correct the certificate. All right, now I'm going to invite Daniela to talk about today's schedule. Thank you, Katrin. Okay, so we are back to our regular schedule today. At 10.05, Kun is going to start his very interesting talk. Followed by that at 11 o'clock, we are going to have a Q&A session. And then at 11.05, the most exciting thing, three lucky teachers are going to win some wonderful prizes. And at 11.10, we sadly have to say goodbye, but you will receive your certificate. Over to Katrin for the speaker's introduction. Thank you, Daniela. All right. Now, our today's speaker. Hi, Kuhn is here. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Kuhn. Okay, we will still have teacher keep signing. So thank you very much uh, to join us, Kuhn, today. Well, um, before we start, let me introduce Kuhn to you. He is our one of the most loved speaker among all our festivals. Teacher always said, wow, I learned so much, uh, so many new ideas. So Kuhn has a background in psychology. Kuhn has a special interest in experimental coaching and he's passionate about change. About the experimental coaching, he's going to talk about coaching with horses today. And he also specializes in innovation in language teaching. He has been involved in EOT as a teacher, teacher trainer, and is a frequent speaker in EOT conference in Mexico and abroad. Kuhn has worked in nearly almost uh, we should not mention about the years, but over 30 years, every area of EOT publishing and is currently the director for Happily English in Mexico and Central America. And no exception, we always ask our speaker to tell us what they like most in Mexico. 
And when I post this question to Kun, he doesn't even blink. He just said, Gila Gilis from South Savete. Okay, that's his favorite. I think he still like Chapas. He still love Guadalajara and all the teachers come from over the place. All the places he has been travel over uh, the whole Mexico. Yeah, but his true love is always Chilaquilis. All right, now let's welcome Kun. Thank you, Katrin. That was a very nice introduction. Um, yes, I've been in Mexico for 30 years and it's not just Chilaquilis I like. Uh, I was looking at the places where everybody's from and actually, I've visited most every place that people say they're from. Um, I love Mexico and I love the people. I think the people and nature and food, of course. Anyway, today is about Engage Me and about motivation. Very quickly, whenever you see this symbol, just please share your answers or your thoughts about the questions I'm asking you on the chat box. So we have a bit of interaction here. Okay, so what you will learn in this lesson, in this session, we have two parts. Uh, the first one is more about the mind and self, and the second part is about the optimal experience and how we can create these optimal experiences in the classroom. So, first part, the last poem. This is a true story. It's a story about my grandma. And my grandma was 99 years old and the whole family, we were about 100 family members, we were all rooting for her to be 100. And so every time we would say, oh, yes, grandmom's going to be 100. Grandma's going to be 100. And grandma, this is not my real grandma, by the way. I Googled a picture. Okay. So grandmom actually said, you know, I don't know if I want to be 100, but everybody was rooting for her. And then the doctor said, well, if you want to be 100, you can't eat all these foods. She likes her beer and her cake and her fries and her cheese. And um, then you will be that 100. You will make it then. And my grandma thought, no, I don't want that cake. And I don't like this doctor. I'm going to keep eating what I like. I like my cheese. I like my cake. I like my beer. I like my wine. And I'll change the doctor for a bottle of champagne every day. A small bottle she drank every day for the last almost 100 days of her life. Because every day she was celebrating the last day of her life. She was celebrating her life. And yes, yeah, she didn't make it to 100. She passed away before that. But she wrote a poem, the last poem. And so here goes. I have been to all the parties. I have had all the wine. What else is there? Between desire and satisfaction lies the motor of life. And now that I have no more desire, what else is there? And this, when I was asked to do this talk about motivation, I immediately thought of this moment because motivation, we were so motivated to make her go to that 100, but she was not. And that is exactly, I'm very happy she didn't. And I'm very happy she didn't make that, that, that effort. And so we're going to talk about what is motivation and how does it work and how do we, can we create it or can we not create it amongst our students? So here's a question for you. How high is the average motivation in your classes? Is it poor, mixed, or high? Just write A, B, or C. C for poor, B for mixed, A for high. B, 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 C, B, B, mixed, B, B, C, B. Yeah, that's kind of what I expected is you have mixed motivation or poor motivation. And the poor motivation is often because there are past experiences or self-image um, self of I can't learn. And then here's another question. Would you agree with this? That just write yes or no. If you have poor motivation, your classes are exhausting. If it's a mixed motivation, it's a bit of a struggle. But if it's high motivation, it's fun. It's really like um, a knife through butter. Yes, 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 yes. We all agree. We all agree. We all agree. I thought so, of course. So let's talk about from the horse's mouth, the second part of it. So some people may know this about me. Um, I 
um, used to run a coaching company and I was coaching people with horses. So I was using the horses as a metaphor and the horse was uh, represented your challenge, your project or your class or your school or your company or your team. And it was all up to the people to see the horses as the metaphor. And basically, um, it was all about motivation and leadership. It was all about how do people get to work together and reach their goal. It's all about how do you get the horses or your company or your team wants to be with you without having them on a leash or punishing them or making them go somewhere just because they want to be. So we had individuals, we had teams, um, you know, people who came to learn about themselves, learn about their leadership, learn about reaching goals, working as a team, or bonding, just for bonding alone. Uh, these were great experiences. And so this made me think a little bit more and learn a bit more about the brain, about the human brain and the horse brain. And the horse brain has an enormous uh, advantage over us because they have a smell and that smell as with humans is connected to memory, but they have a memory that they, that doesn't disappear. If they have smelled you once, do your breath once, they will always remember who you are and even what you did with them at some point. Um, sensitivity. They have very high sensitivity. Um, basically, uh, they, they, they can feel each other and they can feel each other at a very high distance. And they can also feel when all of a sudden a tiger arrives or a, a danger arrives. And when that danger arrives, one horse will pick it up how it is still not very clear because it's probably often not because they see the danger but because they feel the danger. And when that happens in a second, in a millisecond, all the horses feel that same or connect to that same feeling as the first horse who felt the danger in the first place. And so what happens at that moment is in a millisecond, all the horses start running as if they were one body. They run very fast and because that's their survival instinct. They don't discuss with each other, where shall we go? Or they don't all run in different directions. They all run, amazingly, in the same direction, as if there is, they don't have to say it to each other. They don't have to talk to each other. It's just what happens. Okay, cool. I'm sorry. I have to stop sharing for two seconds oh, because okay. it's a screen issue. So There is a screen issue. Okay, I'm okay. sorry about that. Yeah. So this is, this is what happens. Horses, when they feel something, they immediately transmit this. In Chinese, we would, in the Chinese philosophy, you would call this the qi. So they, they have an energy, and when they perceive something, they pass that qi on to other people. So a happy horse makes other horses happy. A sad horse makes other sad horses sad, right? Um, but they run, and they run all together. Okay, I think our screen is back. Um, yes, exactly. yes, we're back. Okay, thank you, Catherine. So they all run very fast in that direction. If I ask you a question and say, do not think about the Eiffel Tower, what is the first thing you thought about? What's the first thing that came to mind? What was the first thing you thought about when I said, don't think about the Eiffel Tower? Paris, Krebs, the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower, the Tower. Yes, the Tower. So here is how that works. And here I go, I'll go back to how the brain works. It is Notre Dame fashion. Okay. Okay. So here is how the brain works. We have kind of three levels. We have the reptilian brain, which is the action brain. We have the mammalian brain, which is the emotional brain. And then we have the last one that developed is the neocortex, is the cognitive brain. And so the reptilian brain is very fast. It's the, prim it's the primitive part, it's the very subconscious part, and it's a very fast deciding. Basically, that part of the brain is the one that's responsible for the fight and flight focus. It's imagine when you see danger, fight or flight, immediately, bam, bam. That's a survival thing, okay? The second part, 
or the highest part, the rational brain, the conscious, is very slow. It's the decision-taking one, and it needs to think. So the reason why these horses can react as one and so fast is because it is their primitive brain immediately reacts fight or flight and run, and they all run in the same direction, right? The mammalian brain, oops, the mammalian brain is the one that is about emotions. And this is where joy and grief and anger and fear play and so many other emotions. And this is what we call the bonding continue. Meaning when we, we share joy, we share it together and we bond together. When there is grief, when like my grandma passed away, we're all sad, we bond together through that grief. We bond through anger, we bond through fear. And so these are these two continuums that we have in common with horses. We also have the, con the conscious brain and the thinking brain in, in common, except that we have a much more developed logical brain, of course. So the way we work with horses normally, um, and how humans have learned to work with horses is through pain and through punishment. So we control and we, we ride our horse through a bit that we put in the mouth and it's a very painful piece of metal that you put under their tongue. And so when you see riders and you think they control their horse so easily is because the horse can't fight or flight. The horse is trapped through this um, piece of metal. And that again is a metaphor. So can't flight, can't fight. And it has anger or fear uh, and maybe sometimes joy, even because the pain is not there when that happens. But the rider and the horse in general, and I'm not saying all riders, but in general, still today, most people handle the horse through a control. And if you think of the metaphor, this is what we often do with our students. So unleashing the horse promotes motivation. This is when they stop having to do things but they will be with you because they want to do things. And this is a bit where I want to talk about because it is this wanting to be that is what we would like to achieve in our classroom. So here's an exercise I do with my uh, coaches. So this is a team, it's a sales team, and they are working on reaching their goals. And so I asked them to walk with the horse and then make a U-turn and walk towards their goal. And here's what happens. And this is not just this team. This happened most of the time. All of a sudden, at a certain point, the horse stops and the people stop. And if you look at these people, they're all looking at each other. They're not even really looking at the horse. They look at each other and the horse is thinking, what do these humans want from me? And the people say, what's going on? And I don't know what's going on. And they just stand there and they could stand there for quite a long time painfully in not knowing what to do and the horse just standing there not wanting to do and yes as you can see there is no leash so they can't really hold the horse or push the horse and they can't punish the horse and the horse will only go if it wants to go now this is what happens once the team comes together and connects with each other and then connects with the horse then they got this then all of a sudden the horse will walk with them and they got this and they say, and then the horse says, okay, humans, you're connected now. Let's do this all together. And they walk towards the goal. There is, this is all about nonverbal communication. This is all about how the horse feels, how these people are connected or not. And this, if you think about it, is like your classroom. When your students are not connected with each other or not connected to you, or you're not connected to them, then you get that moment where everybody goes like, what's going on? So, as you can see here, we're working with teams. We usually have happy faces at the end of the session. Most of the time, people actually enjoy themselves. But the first steps to get there, the first steps to connect with the horse is to actually breathe. And it is breathing and breathing at their rhythm they will sync their breathing with yours and yours with them, with theirs. And then you somehow your heart sinks with the heart of the horse. And this is true. And when that happens, all of a sudden, that connection makes you one. So when you walk away, the horse will walk away with you. And if you walk in a circle, the horse will walk in the circle 
with you because now it feels one, it feels connected. Okay, so there are three pillars to do this. Three pillars that I learned about and I think I want to share with you because they're, they're probably the most important lesson that I learned when I was working with horses. And everything is based on trust, respect, and understanding. So if you, through that thinking and through your actions and through your mindsets, because it is thinking is an energy, you connect with the horse and you treat it with respect and you try to understand their needs. And then what happens is it becomes a door that swings both ways. And it is trust, respect, and understanding that defines the energy of your relationships, of the relationship with your partner or the relationship with your team, the relationship with your students, it's trust, respect, and understanding. So these are three important pillars, and we'll talk more about that. And it takes me to the next is the sense of self. When I work with horses and when I ask people to work with horses, the reason we do this is because the horse is so much bigger, so much more powerful, so much stronger. And the horse does not read your business card. If your card says, I'm the general director, the horse doesn't care. When you give that to a person, they'll say, oh, he's the general director and there is respect or they respect your authority. But the horse doesn't. And so when you work with horses, basically people are facing their self, the sense of self. So let's talk about that. The mind is a system of beliefs. And that system of beliefs defines how we perceive the world, how we live our lives. So this can be about what's good, what's bad, what's proper, what's improper, what's beautiful or ugly, possible, impossible, fun, boring, success, failure, all these things are beliefs. And the beliefs are about the world, but also there are beliefs about the self. Who do I think I am? And what is it I can do or not do? What are my potentials and so on? So I'm good at, others are better at, I'm smart at, I'm not as smart at, I fail at, I struggle with, I like, I don't like. Those are mindsets. And so all these are mindsets and mindsets can be, the, you can, we can split them up in two types of mindsets. Hmm. There's the fixed mindsets and there is the growth mindset. So the fixed mindsets, let's think about that. Fixed mindsets are things like, I know this, I can't learn this, I don't want this. What other things do you think people think about themselves as fixed mindsets that actually are obstacles to their learning? You can write this in the chat. What are other fixed mindsets? I'm afraid of, I'm not good at, I can't do it. What for? Yes, this is too difficult. I don't like this subject. Exactly. Those are fixed mindsets. Then they could be negative or positive because it could be, I mean, positive saying, I know this already. I don't need more of this. Uh, I'm already, yes, I'm already the best. I won't make it. I'm good at this. Exactly. This is boring. I hope you're not talking about my talk. So, yes, those are the fixed mindsets. And then I've tried this, I don't need this, or it's good enough. If I can understand, that's good enough. I, I've, if I speak with mistakes, it's good enough as long as people understand me. I have a, a, a story here about my daughter when she had to, she was enrolling in university in Europe and she had to pass an IELTS test. And I asked her to prepare, and I'm an English teacher, of course, I was going to prepare her with some materials. And she said, I don't need this, I'm good enough, I know this already. And she took her test. She had to have a seven to get through to the university. And she came back and she had a four. And it was her first encounter with herself because and her belief and mindset of I'm good enough, I know this, and it wasn't good enough. And so she had only three more weeks to actually get this test done again and she did she did work on this and this is the growth mindset a growth mindset is what do you think it is what do you think is the growth mindset what are things we think about when we think about i need to okay i need to i can try 
learning from my mistakes. Yes, I can try, I can do it, exactly. I could do better if, what if I read uh, a, a text every day? Uh, what if I listened to the radio in English every day? Maybe if I studied more, my, my scores would be better. I would, um, I could, if I want to, I'm strong enough. Yes, this is a growth mindset. It is the growth mindset basically is the mindset of possibility. It is where you believe that things can, are possible, but it is in you. It is not out there by, that has to be done by some, somebody else. So there are beliefs and expectations. There are emotional expectations, which is regards to the outcomes, intrinsic or extrinsic. There is expectations and confidence regarding one's own capability, the expectancy, and there's a perception that I will get what I desire. This, we call it instrumentality. Okay, so there are five things we can do. There are many more things we can do to create the basis or the, the surroundings for motivation. We can't motivate our students, but we can create the settings. We can create the basis and the environment so that motivation uh, can be unleashed if you want. So the first one, just breathe. Jane Ravel talked about this yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday. Just breathe. And as I said, breathe and sync with the horse. Breathe and sync with your class. You can do a simple breathing activity at the beginning of a class. Or you can do de-stress activities. This is from American Jetstream. Just do little physical activities that have nothing to do really with teaching English, but they have to do with just de-stressing and doing something together as a herd, if you want. And then the energy of your classroom will change. Connect and bond. Um, an example here, what is your Chinese horoscope? Do you know? Does anybody know what their Chinese horoscope is? I'm a dog, for example, rat, rat, oh, so many rats, dog, horse, 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 monkey, dragon, dog, rooster, rooster, oh, so many people know. Well, for those who know, do you also know what it means? Um, because there is, of course, a meaning to the horoscope. If you don't, then I suggest you use American Jetstream and use the I'm a dragon um, in beginner level. No, it's the elementary level. The point here is you first. So we talk about you first, you as the person, you as, so we did some breathing as a connection, but the other thing is we bond with people because all the dragons probably will identify each other and the rats will identify each other. But we talk about you. We care about you first, your opinion first, who you are first. And we bond and enjoy the class before we get into the topic, before we get anywhere. The number three thing to do is to build trust. And you build trust, as Nicola was saying yesterday in her session about feedback, is it's about planning, planning your feedback, but also lesson planning. If, if your students know that you know, if they trust that you know what you're doing and that you prepared your classes for them, then they will trust that you're doing the right thing and they will follow you. This is what happens with horses. I'll go back a little bit to the herd. Every day, horses, the, the lead horses have to establish, there are two, usually two leaders. One is the mare, the lead mare, and the other one is the stallion, the lead stand-up stallion. The stallion leads from behind and the mare leads from the front in a herd, like when they run away. However, every day that hierarchy is, has to be established. Every day they may be challenged again. So every day you should build that trust again, not just at the beginning of the course, but every time in every lesson, build trust. It's very important. And you build trust basically by knowing what you're doing and knowing what's best for your students. So differentiate and manage expectations. So don't over-manage the expectation. Don't promise things like, oh, you'll be able to travel to New York and understand what people are saying, because that is not true, especially not when they are beginning students. That will happen maybe after three, four years of studying English. But you can manage their expectations. You can also differentiate. Some students are stronger, as Nicola again said in her talk yesterday. She uses stronger students 
to help the weaker students or to model in a class because they have more, diff more, more confidence. Also differentiate is in those fixed beliefs, I can't do this, I'm not good in English. Let's differentiate this a little bit. We can have a conversation with our students because um, maybe you're not good in speaking, but how about listening? Of the four skills, which one do you think is your strongest one? And the student, by starting to see a differentiation in what he can do well or not so well, might actually change his mindset or her mindset and say, okay, I'm not good at English speaking, but my listening is quite good and I actually enjoy reading. Okay. And when you do that step by step, that differentiation will change the mindset. And then finally, energize, as I said, the three true pillars is trust, respect, and understanding will energize or create the right energy in your classroom. As I said, you cannot motivate your students, but you can create the environment in the classroom and in your relationships. So always remember this metaphor. Your class is like a horse, but also for the students, English may be like a big horse that they need to know how to deal with and how to become friends with. So that was the end of part one. Now let's move on to part two. Part two is about the optimal experience. So once we've established this relationship with, if you want, where we say, okay, now I've established there's trust, there is understanding, there is respect, we breathe and we're sinking together, we have goals together and we want to reach them together. But what is the best experience for the student? What do you think? What is the best, the best moment for the student? Any ideas? When they can do it. Yes. So when they have learned, when you, they get the feedback, when they, in, or in gaming, of course, yes, holidays, of course, is also one. Uh, when they are heard, when you play games, when they enjoy, when they are learning, when they get feedback, when they can produce. Okay. Now, what is the best moment for the teacher? Apart from holidays and paydays, of course. What is the best moment for the teacher? When the students understand, when you see that they have learned, um, when they enjoy a funny class, when students learn well, when they see the results, when they... Okay, so in a way, what you just said is the best moment for the student and the best moment for the teacher is when the students learn, when they reach the results, when they can do it, when the teacher has achieved that result or when the students have received that result. So for the students, the best moment, the optimal experience is the same as the teacher. Now there's a theory about the optimal experience and that is by a man called Mihaly, Jisen Mihaly. And he's the father of the psychology of optimal experience. And he says the best moments usually occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limit in an effort to accomplish something that's difficult and worthwhile. Now, wow, this is a very short sentence in a way. So the best moments occur when the person's body or mind is stretched to its limit. So you need to be stretched to feel that you've achieved something, that you made an effort to accomplish something that is either difficult or worthwhile. And of course, what is difficult and worthwhile will be different for different people. So the way these things work a bit is you have a comfort zone and then you have a fear zone. And if you move beyond the fear, then you come into your stretch zone or your learning zone. If we stretch too far or we stretch our students too far, they may come into a panic zone. So the way this works is very simple. So on the one hand, you have skill, and then at the bottom, you have challenge. And so it just goes from low to high. We start with our comfort zone. We have low skill, we have low challenge, we stay there. We are not really interested in doing anything. I'm happy where I am. Now, what do you think happens if the challenge is low, but the student skill is high. So you, you have advanced students and you give them a very easy task. What do you think will happen in the classroom? What do you think? You give them a very 
way too easy activity. They get bored, boredom. Yes, they get bored. They are bored, 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 bored. Exactly, bored. That's the thing. What thing? What do you think will happen when they have a low skill? So they're beginning students, but you give them a very high challenge, something that is way beyond their capacity. What do you? Frustrated, stress, frustrated, frustration, stress, 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 frustration, alert, stress. Yes, I want to go home. <laughs> okay, disinterest. Exactly stressed so when the challenge is too high then we get stressed when the challenge is too low then we get bored so this is what happens in our classroom when you get this mixed motivation is very often because either your students got bored in the past or now uh, or they got stressed all the time every time they were asked to do these things or go through exams and whatever and so that was one of the reasons why they might not like their class so the challenge you have as a teacher, of course, is then to balance this, to balance the skill and the challenge to a point where we move gradually forward and eventually get to the goal. So we match the skill with the challenge in a way, not exactly match, but we constantly mean what we mean is that the challenge shouldn't be way beyond the skill or the skill shouldn't be way beyond the challenge. So. If you don't do that, you have a bored zone or a stressed zone. And the bored zone and the stressed zone, they're both have to zones. This is where people feel, I have to, I'm bored, but I have to take this class. I'm stressed, but I have to do this, right? So how do we manage this? Um, in the center between these two, there is something called the flow zone. This is the want to zone. This is the zone where we want to do things because our skill and our challenge are matched. And I actually feel I'm stretching my, my, myself. I'm learning something, but it is not way beyond my capacity. Have you ever played any of these computer games? You know what they are? Yep, yep, yes, 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 okay, yes, yes, yes. So a lot of people, a lot of people play games either on their phone or computer, maybe you played in the past. And this is the reason why I mentioned this. Yes, yes, we all play, yes, Mario and Angry Birds. Oh, we have fans. Yes, no, some people don't. I usually don't, but there's moments where I played with this more as a psychological study of what's going on and why do people get hooked? And I'll tell you why this happens. So the people who develop these very successful computer games, uh, they, they understand this psychology very well. So if you're bored, you're not going to play it. If you're too stressed, you're not going to play it. So you have to create this moment of flow. And the way they do this is they get you started. And as you start, you're still, your skill grows. And then just as you're getting into the maybe bored zone, they change the level or the challenge and they make you slightly stressed and when you're slightly stressed you engage and you increase your skill as you increase your skill once you now know everything again you might just about to be bored when the computer algorithm changes you back to a stress level and this is how they move you up and up and up and up and up the ladder within that flow zone and this is what keeps you hooked. This is what makes you want to stay. This is what makes you want to play again. This is what gives you a certain level of excitement and satisfaction because you're constantly beating or you think you're beating the system and you feel excitement because you reach your goals. So that is how motivation works is how we can get, and this is our challenge now as, as a as a, as a teacher, is how do we keep our students in the flow? How do we make our class a flow, a, a flow class? You have to remember that when over time, the performance that we will get from our students will be very different if they feel they are in a have to zone, some border stressed, or in a want to zone, in a flow zone. The results are so much better because our students make a discretional effort. Discretional effort means they decide how much effort they want to put in. When they feel they have to, they don't really want to put any effort in.
but when they want to, they will put in the effort and their results are so much better. So again, it comes from their feeling and their beliefs, of course. So flow is a mental state in which the day-to-day -day occupations of our mind and our self-awareness disappear. Your sense of time is altered and the only thing that matters is the activity you are involved in. So this used to happen to me, still happens to me. Uh, if I'm reading a book, um, I may be so involved in that book and in the story, the world around disappears. And uh, in the past, when I was a kid, my mom would call for dinner and I would say, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. But I would just keep reading. And still today, my wife sometimes get upset with me because I will be reading or I'll be doing something and I'm totally in the flow and the world around me disappears. The time is altered. So what can we do to make that happen? The things we can do. So we know that the optimal experience needs a challenging activity that requires a skill. That is how we get into the flow. What other things do you think we can do um, to uh, create this flow? I'll give you one example of an activity. Here's an example. So an activity, a garage sale. I ask my students to sit in pairs and the activity is they have to set the price for each of the following items. Their goal is you have to reach a total of $3,789. So you're going to sell the following items, an old guitar, pair of running shoes, two sets of used pots and pans, a baseball bat and 50 old CDs, right? So you sell these, 50, these, these five items and you have to reach the total of 3,789. So the students have to sit in pair and discuss together um, to set a price for each item. Your language goals, of course, is students practice how much for this one, do you agree, what's the total, how much have we got, and so on and so on. So this is the activity. Now I want you to do this and um, I want you to do this activity, set a price for each item. We can't do it in pairs, but you can do it as individually. Set a price for each item. And when you reach the total of $1,789, write in the chat box, done. Let's do this. So the first, I'll give you some time. Set a price for each of the items and say, if you can reach $1,789, write in the chat box when you're done. I know you're English teachers, so you're probably not so good at math. Okay, done. Okay, done. That's it. Stop it. Stop the activity. We are moving on. Uh, this activity is stopped. And I stop it when it is one pair has reached a goal. So we move on. What do you think will happen if I do this? If I tell everybody, stop, 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 stop. You have to stop. Stop writing. Done. It's done. It's done. It's already done. If I stop the activity when only one pair has reached a goal, what do you think happens? Are they frustrated, the other students, or are they happy? A or B, A or B, A or B, frustrated, frustrated, A, 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 exactly. Why are they frustrated? Because I asked them to reach a goal. And this is the thing. When you have a clear goal and your students have a clear goal and they have an activity that means something only when they reach that goal, then... Of course, they are totally in the flow. They forget about the time. They forget about everything because they're trying to solve this problem. Activities that are problem solving, critical thinking, all of those are very good to reach a flow moment in your classroom. So the optimal experience, we said, of course, is a challenging activity that requires skill. The other characteristics that make for a flow experience, I can't ask you the question, I think, because I'm a bit running out of time, is the following. You need a clear, measurable goal and outcome. Like the activity I mentioned before, the outcome is you need to reach 1,700 and something dollars. And that is what you need to get. So 
this is why those smartwatches uh, lately work so well because you set a goal and then every day you can see if you reach your goal and you can work towards your goal, how much you walk, how much you run, how much you stand and so on. The next one is, as Nicola was mentioning yesterday in her talk, planned and immediate objective feedback. If you get immediate objective feedback, you feel good and your, your growth mindset will be ready to say, okay, so in this case, I was swimming, I swam a thousand meters, that was my open goal. And my total time was 42 minutes. My goal in my head was I wanted to swim a thousand meters in 40 minutes. So what goes through my head when I get this immediate objective feedback is, okay, what can I do? So I could turn faster every time I do a lap, that would help to reduce my time. I can swim a little bit faster and that will reduce my time. And this is how that feedback helps me in my growth mindset. It's objective, but you as a teacher, you're not a machine. You make sure it is positively perceived. Focus. Any task that allows the students to just focus and you create an environment when they can focus without having to worry or stress about the results and there will be, there will be a grade or an evaluation. Those are the activities that can create flow. So the activity, as I gave earlier, where two students or three students have to negotiate the price amongst themselves about these things, that is not about a, a grade. It is just about having practice. So this is what allows your students to focus. Students have a sense of control. They decide if they finish or not. So this is the other thing. You need to feel, it's like when I say we work with the horses. If I put a bit in the horse's mouth, then the horse has no decision, has no control, and therefore will enjoy less what I do with the horse. However, if I take away the bit, if I take away the control and I allow the horse to work with me or not, you can see immediately that the horse will be so much eager, so much more eager and so much more enjoying that activity. And that is the same in the classroom. Let your students entrust the process, give them that freedom. And then finally, students experience a loss of self-consciousness, the merging of action and awareness. They become the action. So if you have a role play or you have this kind of challenging activity where they have to solve a problem and they're not so focused on the language results, whatever, but focused on the activity, they become the activity, they become the action and they can totally lose themselves. A good example often is, for example, projects. I think Catherine will talk about later. In most of Helpling textbooks, we have uh, CLIL projects and the students are asked to do some research and work together and discuss this together and then publish it. And then they become the reporter, they become the journalist. And so you, there's so many opportunities in the classroom where you can actually create a, a situation where the students own that activity and lose this idea of self-consciousness. That they become not aware perhaps of the mistakes they might make and much less self-aware of things they do. And then finally, the last one is an altered sense of time. Time stops when you're in the flow. And that is kind of what just happened to me. Time stops when you're in the flow. I just finished my talk. I think most of the ideas that I wanted to share with you not just don't just come from the horses, but a lot of these ideas come from Jetstream Studio. And the hand, three handbooks that I highly recommend is Psychology in Practice, Energizing Your Classroom, and Creating Motivation. So... Don't forget the metaphor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kun. It has been wonderful. It's really nice. I am going to stop your presentation first. Okay. Well, it is really nice. I think it's from the horses. People are like, wow, wow, I never know about that. To you explain about the brain science, and then you move to all the flow zone. 
you have to, you want to, and then at the end with all these fun project activities, I think uh, uh, some teacher says, these are so important, but a lot of teachers, sometimes we are so busy to catch our curriculum and all the, finish all our exams, and we forgot to put this in the class. We should relax our students so students can learn better, and we should understand them so they can actually engage more. It's been wonderful. I will leave you. Uh, thank you very much first. I think teacher are all giving you a big applaud on chat room at this moment. Okay, I'll leave Daniela and you for the Q&A session. Okay, Daniela, shoot. I'm shooting you two questions. Uh, what are some effective strategies for increasing student motivation, especially for those students who may be struggling academically? Okay, so students who are struggling academically, usually, and because everybody can learn languages, this is something Noam Chomsky said, and everybody that has studied this, is we can all learn three, four, five languages, as long as we feel we need to, and as long, of course, as um, we are exposed to the language. And so the, the motivation about this is what makes you learn or not learn. Now, if you believe you don't know, you don't need it, or if you have had very bad experiences and you have a self-image of, I can't do this, as I was talking about the self-image and those fixed mindsets, I can't do this, I have bad experiences. And usually it's about the bad experience. Usually by the time you get that student, he's had an experience where he didn't make it and he wasn't as good as others and he was a bit frustrated with that. And, you know, they start to struggle because they don't want to make the effort anymore. It's remember, it's a discretional effort. I, I feel I have to and I don't want to because I don't I can't do it. And that is when people struggle. But that can change and you can change the mindset. You can't, as I said, you cannot motivate your students, but you can change their mindset. And and it begins by maybe you making a difference as a teacher being a different teacher than the experience like show them that the past experience is not something that's written in stone you can change that mindset little by little but that takes time because it's a belief and beliefs are one of the things that are hardest to work or to change you know don't ask i mean ask a christian to become a buddhist is not and it's not very easy or the other way around so so that is something what can we do trust think and understand your students understand and differentiate i think that's what i was trying to explain in the talk and i'm seeing that many teachers agree with you uh and the second question would be uh, sometimes teachers struggle with balancing intrinsic and extrinsic motivation how do you suggest that they do that right that's a very a very interesting question so Yes, uh, in intrinsic motivation, which is your motivation, is about what you expect to get out of it and uh, the effort you want to make to get there and so on. That's your intrinsic motivation. The extrinsic motivation, of course, is the things that happen beyond you. And that is, um, yeah, the, the, the grades you will get or the piece of paper you will get. And of course, those things are, are important. They're institutionally there. But they, they usually aren't really great motivators because they are the things that you have to do to get the paper, you have to do to pass the exam. So the important thing to balance is that we try to achieve with our students this kind of herd mentality where the goal is the goal. Is not just my goal as a teacher because if, it, if they believe it's my goal, then that's extrinsic, right? But if it became our goal, if we as teachers and students, if we have this moment where we come and sync with each other and understand what we would like to get out of the class, and then we work together towards that, and we work, and once people have these positive experiences, they will want to repeat like in the computer game. And then it becomes not just the pressure of the exams because they're there, we can't deny them. We still have to work towards those grades and two exams. But you can only do this if you get the want to to happen in the classroom. If you get your students into that kind of flow every time they come in the class and they, they have a smile because they know something fun is about to happen. Okay, so, thank you very much, Akun. Yeah. And thank you, Daniela. I think it's been really nice Q&A session. And 
I, I remember I read uh, one sentence which probably can even like summarize the whole the whole student's feeling is everyone want to be acknowledged, understood, and loved. So once you actually can similar to your triangle, once you can reach that, then um, student is very easily to engage for what you are trying to explain to them. That is so true. Yes. All right. So thank you very much for the Q and A session. And I now will let you have a, a two minutes break, and then I will move to uh, my uh, introduction session for our uh, two project. Okay. Uh, for the last three days, I have been introducing uh, JetStream and Studio, and I mentioned about two projects. One is our cyber homework, which is online in our um, platform. The other one is Clear Project. And a lot of people always like, what is Clear Project? How does it work? And how does your cyber homework work? And here it is. So I'm going to talk about our cyber homework today, and they applied in our three courses, JetStream, American JetStream, British JetStream, and the studio, same as British American, and also for real plus. And how does our homework work? It's pretty much, let me see, does the, my video work? Okay, I will use American JetStream as an example. You just assign your homework as a teacher. You log in, you assign your cyber homework, and you can actually see every unit have uh, three lessons, and they have a homework, and you click, and you assign, and it's pretty much about 30 seconds done, and you can change your deadline, and then once you assign, all your students receive an email. And so Maria, you have homework and you, Maria start to sign in and start to do all kinds of homework. He has grammar, vocabulary, you have listening and your student can keep doing the homework until that deadline. And then you, as a teacher, you can see the student's result and you can see the student's learning report as well. And the learning report, you can actually export to your school system. And now I'm moving to the more complicated clear project. So what is a clear project? The idea is similar like Vygotsky's uh, collaborative learning. So here you go. We have two kinds of project. One is individual writing project, which is online. You, okay, let's see the flow chart. One, teacher, you assign the clear project to your student. And two, your student receive the notice and then they will do the research. You say, okay, there was a topic. They will do the research. They will write a project report. And then you go to the three. In the meantime, there's a deadline. The student will read all the other students' project and they will give points. You got three star, four star, and teacher, you can also read and give feedback. Depends on if you have time for that or not. And then at the end, teacher, you get the learning reports. So. Let me show you the real example. So I'll use for real plus as example. So in the elementary level, there is a project. It's called the best holiday destination in your country. So we, what we want students to do, you just, as a teacher, you click and you assign and your student will receive all this instruction. What's the best holiday destination in your country for people in your age? Um, prepare a poster and to advertise the place. So here are some questions to help you. So we have all this help. So where is the place? What's special about it? So what your student need to do is read, research, think, and write. So I give you the example of your students. So student number one, Gabi. So Gabi said, I wouldn't really like chapas, especially palanque, because da 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 Okay, then said, so, oh, okay. So she, she read, she research, she think, she write. And it's not end. When she finished, she can go to read other students' articles. So here comes Abraham. Abraham said, oh, I like Chepe. Chepe is so cool. You can take the train. And then he had to do all the research. He probably copy encyclopedia or check all the others, but he has to research. And then Gabi will read all this and say, oh, that's really interesting. And she can write comment or she can vote. I like this article. I give you three stars. Then she moved to the other one. Mariela said, I like Tulum. And because there's a beautiful sea, the Caribbean, and it's in Quintana Roo. And then Gabi said, oh, I like this even more. I give five stars. So I know teacher, you all say it's very cool. This is a wonderful project. And then at the end, you as a teacher, you can even uh, vote as well if you want, or you can write comments. Okay, 
for Mariela Tulum. You said, it is a very nice article and you have done good research. I have never been to Tulum, but after reading your project, I think it's a beautiful place here in Mexico and I would love to go someday. Okay, and here you get your total report. Then what happened? Okay, all your students have a voting. So Mariela Tulum got 73 points. Gavi got 56. Abraham's Chepe got 39 points. Then you say, okay, the first three students, you go to present. So this is really nice for a writing, a kind of collaborative learning. And now we go to group project. Okay, so how do you do that as a group? Because if you say, oh, my student, uh, I don't want them to write all the time. So every module we have individual writing we also have group project so here is studio as example as you can see we have group and individual so here we want students to create a tv or film quiz so you get together you start to discuss okay uh, how do we do this and you have to learn to negotiate and then so here is the flow you choose your topic you create your quiz you check your questions and then you present in the class and then you give feedback and re reflection. So question, teacher, you can play as well. Imagine we have done all this. Then I have question one. Who is the leading actor in Titanic? Okay, uh, where was the movie? Are the Africa shooting? Uh, three, how many Mission Impossible movie by Tom Cruise have been made? So here you actually learn, do the research about the movie and about all this Ah, DiCaprio. Okay, everybody knows. Now here's the answer. We are not really doing the class, so I'll show you. Then other students can answer. So you have your student by groups, then that's how you do it as a group project. And if you don't want to do group, you can do individual, then all the students do a movie review. They find a movie they like, they write a review, like this one is Titanic. Okay, so what does Clear Project help you to achieve in your class? Your student learn research, writing, reading, presenting, and they have creativity developing and critical thinking, collaborative learning and teamwork. Remember, they have to negotiate. So here is the Clear project. It goes to Just Dream Studio and For Real Plus. And if you are very interested in all this, contact us for more presentations. All right, I finished my Clear project and cyber homework. Now we move to lucky draw so daniela is going to announce the prize and kun is going to draw the winners so daniela over to you yes so the today's prizes were carefully selected by kun so three lucky teachers are going to be receiving a copy of american Jetstream second edition they are going to be receiving psychology in practice which is a very interesting book and also two titles from Arthur Conan Boyle, Sherlock Holmes and The Stolen Jewels and The Red, the Red, the Red Headed League. So the, these two readers come with a online homework and exam preparation. So very good luck to you all. All right, so Kun, we are going to find three lucky teachers. You ready? I'm ready. I hope you all are. All right. Here we go. Fingers crossed. Number one. Dun, 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 dun. Jessica Mendoza. Congratulations, Jessica. Next one. Next one. Three, two, one, and Berenice Garcia Hernandez. Yeah. Congratulations, Berenice. The and the last one. Three, two, one, and... Rosario Cruz Solis. Congratulations, Rosario. I hope you enjoy the readers and the book. Congratulations, three lucky teachers. Our happening team will contact you and will send you the prizes. Okay, as you know, if you attend our live webinar today, you will all receive our digital certificate after the event. And before we move to the next page, let's all give Kun a very big hand. Thank you very much for your great talk. We are all Thank in the you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. Okay. Tomorrow is our closing plenary by Robert Campbell, and he is going to talk about video. 
how do you use video? How do you encourage your student to be um, more engaged in your class or even outside the classroom to learn English? So he's going to share a video playlist for teachers. And here we are going to say goodbye to you. And if you haven't registered Rubber Session, please go to happilingmexico.com to register Rubber Session. And we are going to say goodbye to you with the music Kun selected for you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.